This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. So good to have you all back to another exciting episode of Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live here from our paradisal metropolis, metropolitan paradise of Honolulu, Hawaii. And I could have said, should have said, because to some degree, when you look at what we eat at the food supply um, versus some hundred years ago, when we were 100% on our own, we're actually only, uh, you know, to a minimum fraction of that. So one could also call us a, a food desert. And in order to change this back to where it was, we have our perfect guest for that today. That's Gundula Pox. Hey, Gundula. Hello. I'm Arden. Thanks for being here. And Gundula is a fellow German, but don't worry, we're not going to talk in German here, at least not all the time. Although I gave your show a, a dual sort of language title, and I, I pretty much called it Gundula's Greens Garden City slash, and here comes the German part, Gundula's Grüne Genießbare Gartenstadt. So you guys figure that out, what that means. So uh, please uh, share with us your exciting research. You're an associate professor at the University of Washington, at the College of the Built Environment, and you're an architect by training, having worked for Richard Meyer and, and other important people. And so, um, and your research is in that to, to bring us back the green into our originally jungle environment here. So we're so excited to hear how you do that. And you do this by introducing to us a book that you uh, wrote a while ago. And we saw that, I think, here at the very beginning. So please, let's jump right in. Yeah, I wrote this book, uh, Creating Urban Agricultural Systems, an Integrated Approach to Design, specifically for architects and designers in the built environment, mm -hmm. because they often don't understand what is necessary and don't understand the greater implication. I admit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> the book is basically in two parts. One part looks at the environmental systems that are needed, and the other one is uh, about the human expertise. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to the um, next slide, you see that... Um, okay, we can so get the first slide up, please, which, number one. So that, this yeah. is the book cover. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we are like get off one. We meant the number two, yeah, sorry. So um, the yeah, environmental inputs that you need to grow mm -hmm. are clear. Mm -hmm. Water, nutrients, and solar energy mm -hmm. when we grow plants. Um, so that's pretty much clear to everybody. But when you start to look the, at the larger implications on the global systems, urban systems, it gets complex quite uh, quickly. And so um, looking at these three large areas here, water, for example, when you look at the urban water cycle, you can uh, identify in design with urban agriculture, uh, alternative water sources. We all talk about rainwater harvesting, gray water use, or uh, building wastewater. Mm -hmm. And they could be introduced into um, urban growing. That's, for example, condensation for yeah, air so conditioning. Exactly. You sort of here mm -hmm. have probably a lot of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So unused water that is often very little polluted or you know clean enough to grow. Mm -hmm. And so we don't take that in account, mm -hmm. so an awareness will help. Mm -hmm. And then what, like urban agriculture build, can be also a um, means to uh, low impact water management. So mm -hmm. it has m a lot of positive impacts mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um, the water cycle. Mm -hmm. And then the nutrients, let's go to slide three, please. Yeah, so the, the nutrients, um, we don't have closed loops anymore. When you look at the green part of this diagram, that's a natural system that mm -hmm. closes uh, on itself, but human intervention have brought it out of balance. Mm -hmm. And this is especially um, dangerous when you uh, think about finite mm -hmm. nutrients. Mm -hmm. So the only way, uh, way we can preserve them and for generation to come is to effectively recycle them. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we close the loop? Mm -hmm. with uh, nutrients mm -hmm. and potentially um, generate energy, composting, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so on. So, yeah. And that's on any level, mm -hmm. technical. 
And the third one is the other source, which we have plenty of here, which is the sun. Yeah, so if you go to the next slide, um, the photosynthesis process drives the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. And we often forget this. Mm -hmm. And like one of the largest challenges for us in the built environment is really climate change. Mm -hmm. right? And we work very hard. But if we understand that this is all set in motion by growing mm -hmm. vegetation, mm -hmm. we get, you know, can have a larger impact. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I think, a little bit forgotten that these two are so tightly connected. Mm -hmm. So we in our everyday, in oh, our yeah. everyday yeah, yeah, work. Yeah. So grow more to save the planet, that's what you're saying. Kind mm -hmm. of. So the second part of the book is then uh, about looking at what people need to bring to this, so mm -hmm. the human expertise. Mm -hmm. And maybe to start this, just to um, see the in slide five, how I've um, organized this. These are common um, growing systems in urban agriculture. From the upper left, the most natural permaculture that mm -hmm. tries to mimic natural systems mm -hmm. to the most technically advanced or technically uh, amended is um, indoor growing. Mm -hmm. So while permaculture uses everything as nature does, uh, indoor growing needs everything artificially mm -hmm. from irrigation to minerals for uh, fertilization to electrical light. Mm -hmm. so and, and the enclosure potentially. Yeah, the enclosure of course, climate. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is also like the, mm -hmm. what is indoor and what's mm -hmm. outdoor. Mm -hmm. And then the next slide shows you an overview of looking at these different systems from a regular soy-based farm to an indoor growing and mm -hmm. compares how much startup funding do you need? What's the area you need to run a commercially viable farm? How many people will need to work there? And what's the productivity? Like mm -hmm. how much can you produce with the system? Um, granted, most of my research is based on temperate climate. Mm -hmm. So when you see the diagrams, mm -hmm. the outdoor growing is a maximum of nine months, six yeah. months often. That's where uh, we here. come from originally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where we come from. <laughs> You here in um, Hawaii have, of course, a 12 month mm -hmm. uh, growing cycle, but indoor forget. growing mm -hmm. would have that mm -hmm. in other um, yeah. climates. So yeah. mm -hmm. the production is quite different mm -hmm. uh, depending mm -hmm. on what mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. you select. And you have and a great next slide that shows all these things considered, right, encompassing in one yeah, compelling so diagram yes. showing all these components, how they interact. Yes, yeah, so this is basically what the humans have to bring to the table mm -hmm. and not just the farm operation, how to mm -hmm. grow, but also mm -hmm. how to finance, how mm -hmm. to market, how the community is integrated as customers and as, you know, permitting, mm -hmm. allowing this to happen, like all that needs to line up for a farm to, to um, work. Absolutely. And then our professions in the built environment have to come in for mm -hmm. an integrated design mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. understand what is needed. So yeah. only if those three components come together, mm -hmm. I think you can mm -hmm. have a yeah, yeah. successful farm operation yeah, yeah. in and a if, city. And if you guys want to know more about the book, you got to buy it because we're not going to talk about more about it, but we're going to talk where the book is currently leading you to. And if yeah. we can get up the next slide for that, please. More or less, this book led to this uh, international interdisciplinary collaboration, City Food. And this is a project that works on implementing aquaponics on a larger scale in cities, mm -hmm. on a broader scope. And I work with um, research colleagues in Germany, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Brazil, mm -hmm. and um, with my lab at the University of Washington represents the US. So, um, so this interdisciplinary team brings together aquaponic or aquaculture experts and experts from the built environment. Mm -hmm. And we work together to advance mm -hmm. food production yeah. in cities. Mm -hmm. And the environmental, like, really scientifically look at what the environmental impacts mm -hmm. are. We can move on to so the next slide. So if you don't know so much about aquaponics. Yeah. Next slide, please. 
uh, aquaponics sits in the sweet spot, if you look at this um, diagram again, between the natural system and the highly technical ones, mm -hmm. because it is technical in terms of it works on the hydroponic and aquaculture systems, but it uses the nutrients that the fish produce. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. naturally produced nutrients, for the most part at least, that are then brought to the plants, and therefore it has in terms of sustainability, a really large uh, potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know more about um, the meaning of it, aquaponics, mm -hmm. if you go to the next slide, it just shows a very, very rudimentary understanding that fish produce waste mm -hmm. that's then transformed into nutrient by microorganisms mm -hmm. and that then the plant can take up. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what physically has to be there, it's one of the aquaculture component, as in fish tanks and all the environment that mm -hmm. is needed to support the fish, and then a distribution system, which farms have used all kinds of hydroponic mm -hmm. distribution mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the minimum setup. Mm -hmm. And it comes in all sizes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, these systems. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one, which is briefly touching on why uh, aquaponics again, and then more importantly, because there's actually also a show uh, that deals with all the subject matter, so we're like in the interstitial phase and space as well between that show and our show. So what are the architectural implications? Yeah, right? so why would architects exactly. work on why this? why would they have to bother with that? And um, if you go back to the slide 11, um, this is sort of our uh, preliminary classification so you have the system, mm -hmm. but then in most climates, temperate climates, mm -hmm. you need an enclosure mm -hmm. as in greenhouse or growth space. And then you have to set up an operation, the farm operation, mm -hmm. and the context to the city. Okay. Or the yeah, connection to yeah. the city. And in these later three, you know, the built environment professions are mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. important. So let's look at some of these. You brought some examples here, some precedents. So let's move on to the next so the slide. State of the art currently in hydroponic and adopted by many of the uh, aqua, large aquaponic farms are these, um, you know, Big highly, highly um, techni technically supported mm -hmm. greenhouses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, large arrays of these gutter connected greenhouses. Mm -hmm. um, and these don't necessarily care how they are operated, even energy-wise, right? No, no, so it could no, yeah. be still on a, on a fossil yeah, system, Yeah, they are right? all on uh -huh, a fossil. Uh -huh, There's a large yeah. footprint um, yeah. because they can be placed almost anywhere. Yeah. We have found them anywhere yeah. in the U.S., yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in any climate uh, zone. And that's and interfering with our mission of saving the climate, the planet exactly, as well, right? Exactly. So let's move on to the next, which is more interesting to that degree. Right? Yeah, so we... Uh, uh, we researched those, but we are really um, interested in passive solar greenhouses. Mm -hmm. So the aquaponic solar greenhouse is a great example from Germany. Um, these take basically a passive solar idea, mm -hmm. and that is uh, or has been introduced early when in the 70s, US and Germany mm -hmm. talked about passive solar. Mm -hmm. Chinese actually did it. Mm -hmm. It's vastly distributed through mm -hmm. the country. They mm -hmm. grow in the northern region mm -hmm. huge amounts of vegetables with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and we don't know about mm -hmm. it. And it's basically at almost no energy mm -hmm. uh, cost, mm -hmm. no carbon footprint. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like these more um, still in a testing phase, prototype phase, mm -hmm. very, very promising mm -hmm. examples we found. But here, you don't, don't need even it. Need that. So let's go to the next <laughs> yes. slide because you're looking at us here on the next slide. Yes. So you have the great climate. We're you don't really need. Paradise. You are in paradise. You don't need an enclosure. Mm -hmm. So we've used some protection. Sometimes you see some of the farms have covers for solar protection or rain mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the crop is not damaged, but mm -hmm. they can be just um, out in the open. Mm -hmm. They're not very dense, mm -hmm. um, for that matter, but um, yeah. productive. They're not yet so architecturally, so let's jump into that and with the next slide. Yeah, here. so this is a really amazing prototype or uh, a case study. It's not a prototype. It's actually now implemented on a larger scale as Sky Greens in mm -hmm. Singapore. 
where you can compare the climate. Mm -hmm. The um, crop is grown on vertical racks, these A-frames, where the conveyor belt takes mm -hmm. <laughs> crops mm -hmm. up and down. Mm -hmm. And they are exposed on the top to more sunlight and then less on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom, they also get irrigated. You exactly, me, right? yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, they cycle several times a day. Mm -hmm. And they are, if you go to the next slide, um, enclosed by a very transparent but very vertical greenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They are up to 18 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So they need structural support, but also protection from the sun mm -hmm. and from the mm -hmm. heavy daily mm -hmm. rain there. Mm -hmm. And so they, they basically hang in a structure that mm -hmm. the greenhouse is very different than we conceive mm -hmm. greenhouses mm -hmm. usually. So it's very, um, it, and I would, not having done the research, I believe this could be a great oh, yeah. uh, setup for um, Hawaii. Well, and if, if you look at it, you know, it's almost like the, the new crystal cathedral. I mean, yeah. This has a very powerful architectural. And the productivity um, is much higher because yeah, yeah. you have the vertical yeah, yeah. Yeah, on yeah. a very small scale. Well, one, one criticism you had is, and we might move on to the next slide while we talk about that this, this uh, you know, is very land consuming. So it's probably going to be more on a suburban sort of a scale, right? Um, not necessarily. No, but not so uh, Singapore has a similar condition. It's an island mm -hmm, and they have mm -hmm. other, even denser than you are here. That's, that's true. And yeah. so this is a rendering, I think, in a further distance um, stage of uh, development of mm -hmm. uh, sky greens but they have already a small array of these mm -hmm. tall greenhouses mm -hmm. so what is seen on the left are these greenhouses they mm -hmm. can be tightly packed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they can build you know a whole yep. plant factory yeah. 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 yeah that reminds me of something we're gonna look at the end but next picture is i was probably uh Excuse myself to be a little bit more thinking about integrating in, a, in an existing yes. urban fabric, yeah, so which this, this system one. here is doing. Right. This is basically the low-tech version, also in Singapore, mm -hmm. has a similar A-frame that is static. Mm -hmm. So it's to be able to uh, operate it. It's not as high. Um, the plants need to more solar protection so that the top doesn't get damaged mm -hmm. from solar mm -hmm. radiation. Mm -hmm. But it is on existing rooftops mm -hmm. in the city. So you see in the um, lower, smaller photograph that yeah. it's actually in an urban context. Yeah, I see them all over Waikiki now in my mind because if I would take you, unfortunately you have to fly back to a neighboring island early tonight, but next time I take you up to the sky of Waikiki, which is a, a rooftop restaurant, uh, and you look at nothing but underutilized, yeah, exactly. just roof membrane skies. So these, these guys could be all over the place and then they could be the people who operate them could be some that were usually traditionally called um, you know homeless which could become farmers that you train and could operate the system and make themselves meaningful as another sort of a component maybe very visionary yeah the com crop is that's one part of their mission to mm -hmm. say we need to utilize the roofs mm -hmm. very good and let's then go the, to the next yeah, page so here the next step in our research is how can we integrate this in buildings? And here the um, ICTA building in Barcelona is actually um, a building, a university campus building, research mm -hmm. facility that has integrated rooftop greenhouses. Mm -hmm. And they investigate, have the set up to um, measure the integration with the building system. So mm -hmm. that is the most advanced example we found to date that really looks at building integration yeah. in its highest development yeah, yeah. not just placing it on top but really integrating yeah. it with system and you just having been up at our academic hill here at the university of hawaii manoa i i can see you wishing you know <laughs> we would have a, a demonstration project like that too yeah, yeah, uh, obviously yeah. you know again less enclosed uh, more open but again, if we don't do it up there, who's going to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The universities can be the driver mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh -huh. make this, test this, yep. and then, you know. Implement it in private practice out exactly, there in the many exactly. neighborhoods in so. need that we have. And, and the next two pictures, uh, the next picture is, is sort of a deja vu or revisiting with, uh, with James Ehrlich. We want to spell him Ehrlich. Hi, James, who I had been in touch, and through Chris Ford. Hi, Chris, who was a previous guest on our show. So it's all reconnecting here. 
and his first regen project here in the Netherlands. And, and James is very interesting to making a follow-up one here in Hawaii. So we need to all reconnect. So explain us a little bit about the one in the Netherlands here. So this is a suburban project to densify suburban living and integrate it with food production. Mm. So they have these greenhouses integrated with um, residential buildings that produce the food for this community. And you see in the next slide that they have these greenhouses also as social spaces. Mm -hmm. So these, in these greenhouses you grow food, you grow your fish, and you socialize. So mm -hmm. a very connected way of thinking about integrating mm -hmm. food production to not make it this technical, disconnected mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. operation, but mm -hmm. really bring people together. You have other heroes that we're going to look at the next yeah, couple of so slides here. Uh, a uh, great French guys who do this maybe even more yeah, so um, the, extendedly. Yeah, um, SOA architects, Paris-based, have great projects. And they are not just beautiful renderings, but they have substance. So mm -hmm. the firm is working both on how to implement them and how to visionary mm -hmm. uh, or in visionary thinking about those. Mm -hmm. And what I really admire about their work is that they juxtapose this food growing with everyday activities mm -hmm. or ex urban experiences. Mm -hmm. You see here a supermarket where the crop is growing on top. You basically, when you buy your produce, you see mm -hmm. crop growing. Mm -hmm. And it's not disconnected as some rooftop greenhouses on supermarkets that mm -hmm. have been actually implemented. Mm -hmm. This one goes a step further mm -hmm. and connects us with it. And celebrate that architecturally, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah exactly. As and a phenomenon, yeah. as a visual. And, and, then and then the, there's, a, there's an even more speculative one, yes. yet backed up by scientific you know, yes. data, right? The next page in project, please. This one, I thought of you, <laughs> with your jungle <laughs> urbanism. It's in Paris, and these towers would um, sit in the relatively low-rise skyline of Paris. Mm -hmm. And wherever you, in a street, look up, you would see one of those towers. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a fascinating thought. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And they need greenhouses. Mm -hmm. You don't. Mm -hmm. That's so there's true. suspended greenhouses. You yeah. could just suspend the growing here. Mm -hmm. And then one that uh, the next slide is a project thinks about a similar way of integrating with underutilized areas between um, housing projects mm -hmm. that are often not very um, good amenities for people. They don't use them that much. Mm -hmm. But if you put community gardens, and not only community gardens in the ground, but also small greenhouses as here, you could activate that and make that really a social component mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. these uh, residential areas. And the next slide, she sees it also as an urban intervention mm -hmm. where these spaces uh, are activated mm -hmm. also at night. Mm -hmm. You can grow at night and it activates these spaces that in some communities are problem spaces. Yeah, so yeah. I think this is a really um, very thoughtful um, project. It certainly is and we want to prove that even more with the last couple of pictures so we go on to the next one because a lot of that stuff really reminded me a lot of what we were doing research-wise and what we're envisioning here and I would like to have your feedback on you know on that. So this is growing uh, intensified growing out in the countryside mm -hmm. so keeping the farms it's almost like the a sky greens operation where you mm -hmm. don't scatter it and you know have it mm -hmm. traditionally on the ground but mm -hmm. um, in a more compact setting. Mm -hmm. Exactly and the next one here. And then integrating it in buildings so uh, I think from the technical point of view you can do this right. You here in Hawaii have the climate where you could just strip facades mm -hmm. of buildings and mm -hmm. replace it by growing mm -hmm. or integrate it. There are mm -hmm. a lot of facade greenhouses if mm -hmm. needed mm -hmm. and grow vegetables or like productive or non-productive but mm -hmm. make that an mm -hmm. integral part of the building. Mm -hmm. And you haven't recognized this here as our vacation fabric, purely vacation fabric of Waikiki and you have Kurt Sanborn here endorsing 
this sort of intervention here, a sort of re-envisioning that sort of monofunctional urban fabric. I'm a resident there and I swim out every morning and swim far out and then I shut my swimming engines off and I look at the backdrop of the green mountains and I see the grays, the gray ones in front and I'm visioning to convert that and this is certainly not meant literally but very figuratively with the many sort of systems you kind of introduce to each other to uh, make that sort of urban um, environment more comfortable um, in, in so many ways, right? The next picture you already uh, alluded to jungleism, right? I mean, this is where we're right now, where we take the genetic code of nature and, and grow these individual plants that are inhabitable. And, you know, they have such a small footprint that you even remember one from your Richard Maya days in New York way back, and they were certainly not aiming towards, you know, being growing towers, but, you know, being having a small footprint means you can get air and light to it from all sides, right? Yeah. And that's what plants want and human beings want. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought, um, also in terms of operation. Mm -hmm. When you start to think about the facade, mm -hmm. so that, that is a thought that has to be how resonance, so if people live behind these mm -hmm, curtains, mm -hmm. green curtains, yeah. living curtains, if they're operated with somebody else, what's the productivity? It doesn't have to necessarily mm -hmm. be, you know, the, the examples we looked at first were mm -hmm. all on productivity. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's, and, and we know, can jump to slide 30 maybe for that uh, reason, because we look into, if we zoom out here, we can see at the top left, the, you know, the dwellers and they're like, it's synchronized with the nature, with the natural environment. And then on, on 29, the benefit uh, would be that, you know, due to their more organic nature, there wouldn't be eyesores as much as conventional hard architecture would be. And they're a softer way. And then again, that's not meant literally, but figuratively in many ways. They would be more pleasant and, and, and would be more appealing so many ways. So let's go to the uh, 31 here real quick because you were talking about photosynthesis which is obviously happening the most at the top right. So here. So, yeah, like I think it's depending on how intense the radiation is that you get the mm -hmm, solar mm -hmm, exposure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this image shows that it also can have a strong social impact. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So between producing for productivity on commercial gain to the social impact of urban agriculture, mm -hmm. you have a wide range mm -hmm. of possibilities mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of them are very valuable. So yeah. if you have facades, or, um, growing facades in, on buildings, mm -hmm. it might impact the residents behind those yeah. facades yeah, the yeah. most and while you not maximize uh, absolutely. production. And we're at the end of the show, but we're going to conclude uh, with the next two pictures here which is touching on that aspect of social because where the building meets the ground, where there's a soil out of which a plant grows, right? That's a very critical level here. And so this is, is showing that not only the sort of production, but also the consumption or the distribution of food yeah. should be a more socially integrated aspect that if we grow more stuff that's produced here, we can eat it right away. And even the people who are underserved, right? We can serve them really sort of easily yes. again. Yeah. So to that degree, I want to share here, this is Primitiva 2 where the same thing happens. And so we were both on the way here. I was trying to give you a quick overview of, of Honolulu and I drove you through Kaka'ako and maybe want to share as your last little sort of, you know, what, what caught you in driving through this new sort of neighborhood and as far as food, you want to share that? It has to do with the green tower. Ah, uh, the green towers, mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> there is no food production, no connection. Mm -hmm, There's a mm -hmm. large supermarket high-end supermarket. Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the only connection people have um, to their food source. Yeah. And it could be much more integrated. Yeah, and it has a green tower, but unfortunately it's only the fossil elevator tower that got painted green. And, yes. and we're talking, you know, you got to replace that with something more clever than everything you've been introducing to us. So I think we're going to say we all better catch up and do our homework because when you come back, hopefully soon, we have made significant steps of improvement. So. You have the climate to do it. Yeah, with if not here, where, right? Yeah, exactly. So, thanks for kicking our butt to that degree, which is much appreciated. 
And so um, hope to see you guys next week for another episode of Human Humane Architecture with uh, John Hara about Hara's paradise of Hawaii up at University of Hawaii Manoa. And until then, please stay as genüsslich as Gundula. <laughs> bye bye.